good morning. I say good morning, everybody. Good morning, you. Uh, my name's James Brown. I'm, uh, I'm a magician, a theatrical pickpocket, a hypnotist. Um, and I spend, uh, uh, I spent the last 20 years being very interested in and fascinated in the way that we as human beings perceive reality. Uh, the way we, we take in information and how we manipulate and change that information to suit ultimately what we already believe is true. Um, and uh, I'm also very interested, and I currently spend a lot of my time working with people to help them understand uh, themselves better, um, find more confidence, uh, feel, yeah, ultimately feel better with themselves. You know, a way of recognizing uh, the, the way we twist reality for our own ends. So today I'd like to share with you a few ideas uh, from my own world that will hopefully help you to understand uh, how you can literally bend somebody's reality for the purpose of healing. Um, so, I think we need to start with a, ba a basic couple of ideas. What is reality and uh, what does it take to bend it? So let's start by looking at uh, how, we, how we view reality, or more specifically, the illusion of reality that we perceive. That was a hideous transformation, by the way. Just as a, a small aside, I work on a Mac, this is a PC, uh, that's just my reality. Um, so we have an illusion of reality, this is something that we all experience all the time. Uh, and it's interesting to me that every one of us falls for the illusion that's created. And the illusion is this, that reality is around us, uh, we have this, uh, you know, 100% of the information available to us, comes straight into our sense of awareness, um, and then we make 100% uh, objective decisions based on that. That's the illusion that we live in, that we see and we hear all of this, and, and we understood what we saw, you know, seeing is believing, as we always get told, seeing is believing, and you know, our awareness takes it all in, and then we make good objective decisions. And the answer is no, not even close. Uh, a much better way of understanding this, a much uh, a more accurate way, uh, not scientifically accurate but metaphorically accurate, is this. First of all, uh, reality comes in via our senses, and our senses are massively limited. As doctors, as medical practitioners at various levels, you will understand this. Uh, my eyes are not seeing everything that I perceive that they're seeing. They are seeing a fraction of that information. My hearing, again, what I hear is being filtered, and I'm hearing some things where, you know, wherever my focus is, my hearing tends to pick things up. Some things break through that focus because maybe I hear my name being called, something that I recognize, and suddenly I fixate on that. But even the moment when I, I'm drawn to my name being called in a crowded room, what I'm actually doing is I'm shutting my attention off from other things that I could be hearing at the time. So there's this huge limitation of our senses. And this comes down into what I refer to as our sub-awareness. Just as a, a, a small thing, I'm not a great fan of conscious and subconscious, or worse still, unconscious. But people call it, talk about the unconscious mind. I mean, have you just looked at the word unconscious in a dictionary? That's an awful description. Uh, I, I like to think of it more of awareness and sub-awareness. There are things that we have a real sense of being aware of, uh, what I would call the doings, the things that we know that we do, that we are aware of doing. And then we have this sense of, uh, of something deeper, something more profound, maybe, uh, which, are, which I would describe as happening. So these are the things that our body automates, it does for us. Uh, every system, every function of your body uh, is controlled at some level by your mind. Now, you're not aware of the vast majority of those things going on. You're not even aware of day-to-day -day things, like the fact that I've suddenly realized I've paced around a little bit. I wasn't you know, consciously aware of taking steps forward and steps back, because that would have looked really odd to all of you watching me. Uh, so a huge amount goes on in, in, our, in our sort of self-awareness. What's interesting about this is that this is very much the seat of our beliefs. And when, I, when I'm going to talk about beliefs today, I'm, I don't want you to misunderstand and think that this is this awareness level, this conscious level of what I think I believe and what I, you know, what I don't believe. Because actually, I think belief is a much deeper, more profound experience uh, uh, of the mind. So what now happens is all of this information floods in through my senses, into my, into my system of beliefs that I already have, uh, which 
could be lies or truth. And I don't know the difference, and neither do you. You have no way at that level of comprehending the difference between what is real and what is entirely illusionary, what is entirely made up. These are just simply what you believe to be true. There's some great experiments done. Um, if I had my, my Mac with me, I could show you. There's, I wasn't a plug for Apple, by the way. Uh, if, if you're listening, Mr. Cook, tell me something nice. Um, uh, uh, there's a great experiment that was done, and uh, there's been a number of these, where they play, you might have known this, they play an audio clip that is gibberish. It means nothing. And then you're, you're given a sentence, you're, you're, you're told a sentence, and then they play the same audio file again, <coughs> and suddenly you can hear that sentence. Are you aware of what I'm talking about? You're not? Okay. Um, so basically there's this gibberish file. Blah, 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 blah. You can't understand it. No matter how many times you listen to it, you never understand it. Then somebody gives you a sentence, and the one that I have is, uh, I think Brexit is a terrible idea. Uh, not a political statement, although I think it's true. Um, and then you play the same file again. So the input is identical, and now you cannot help but hear within that sound file, I think Brexit is a terrible idea. And you will always now hear that sentence, no matter how many times, and no, no matter the distance between hearing it next. The point of this is it shows that our decision making is less to do with the input coming in and more to do with what we already know and already believe to be true. Okay? So now, now we have this information coming in. It now filters up, and, and although you can't really see it on here, uh, I, I've, I've used a, a sort of a, a much paler colour to, to show that only a fraction of information filters up to your sense of awareness. A fraction of information then filters up to your awareness. And in that sense of awareness, you're now uh, rationalising and justifying and just you know playing it through. Uh, at that point, it comes back down into your belief system, and this is what, what I call this cognitive bias loops that are created. In other words, you know, stuff from, from what you believe to be true came up, you were aware of it, and then you just confirmed the stuff you already believed. Yes, you, you are aware of this human nature, this human problem that we have. And at that point, we then have our subjective experience. I would argue that as human beings, we cannot be objective. It is out of our realm to be objective. Even, even when we are objectively looking at objective information that we think is objective, <coughs> we are still experiencing that on a subjective level. And the stuff that's going on deeper down, your, your, your deeper beliefs, are always influencing this journey for you. And it's happening on a, on a level that you are not aware of. All right? Uh, this will become uh, more important as we continue on, and particularly in the demonstration part, and I'm going to talk you through that demonstration. But as a very, very simple idea, uh, I want you to think, or I'd like you to think about it like this. Uh, hypnosis, in, in its simplest form, works like this. If I were to imagine, or what we say, say protect, play act, if I was to play out that my hand was stuck to this chair, and I wanted to show you as the audience, I'm, and I'm a great actor, and I want to prove to this audience watching me that my hand is stuck. What I actually have to do to accomplish that is I have to create as much, um, uh, a, a, as much physiological meaning to, to support that idea. So the way that I pretend my hand is stuck is I don't just like passively hold the chair and go, oh look, my hand is stuck, because that doesn't... That doesn't convince anybody, at least for myself. The way I do that is by pushing down and squeezing tight. If, I was, if, it, if it was to be stuck to a surface, I would push down against the surface. If, I, if my hand was stuck to an object I was holding, I would lock my hand around it and I would squeeze tight. And the very act of squeezing tight would physiologically create an illusion of my hand being stuck. Yes? Right. So, my hand is now stuck to the chair. The only difference between this and my experience of a phenomena of hypnosis is when the information that I'm squeezing that stops coming up to my awareness. Yeah? I am squeezing this 
but essentially, in inverted commas, my body stops allowing my awareness to know that it's doing it. And it goes from something that I'm doing to something that I now experience as happening to me. Just like if you have a phobia, so uh, let's think about, say, arachnophobia. Somebody, somebody's terrified of spiders, and a spider runs along, and they go, ah, and they feel themselves literally leap away from the spider. Their body tenses up. They, they expel this sound of this scream of panic. And if you were to say to them afterwards, uh, why, why did you jump back? They would say things like, I can't help it, it just happens to me, there's nothing I can do about it. I wasn't even aware of what I was doing. Yeah. So all that's really going on is because, you know, nobody else is doing that. They're doing it. The only thing that's changed is whether or not the information, the knowledge that they are doing it, is actually filtering up to their awareness. I also believe, and I think there is evidence to prove this, that the experience we get when we drive a car and you get to your destination and you, you think, oh my goodness me, I don't remember the journey. It, all that's happened is you, you're now good enough at doing this thing that your body has said, do you know what, I don't need to have conscious awareness of this task any longer. It can now drop down into my, into my sub-awareness. And, and, and the whole point is I don't need to rationalise and justify this, this process any longer. I can just get on and do it for you. Much like if you move somewhere and you have um, the stupid English two tap system of hot and cold. Well, I mean, seriously, why haven't we got a mix of taps by now? Nonsense. Anyway, um, uh, I travel a lot, so. Um, uh, if you move into a house and for some reason they're the other way around, initially you reach for the wrong one and you have to, and, and that, that hits your awareness. You go, oh, something's different. I need to justify and rationalise. And then after a while, you start to find the right tab. And then as soon as you get good at doing that, it just drops back down into your sub-awareness. You don't need to think about it any, any longer. And you get on and do it. Just like when you first learned to drive a car, every process had to come up to your awareness to really think about and rationalize and question. And then eventually it all dropped back down and you just carried on and drove. And you don't think about changing gear, putting your foot on the clutch, and all the other bits and pieces that you do. Unless something happens, that makes it shoot back up to your awareness and brings your, your awareness back, your attention back, your focus back to that moment. Um, so, uh, basically we are, we are machines engineered to fulfill our own prophecy. That's what we do. We're engineered to fulfill our own prophecies. Uh, what you believe is essentially what your reality becomes. Your experience dictates how you will continue to believe and see reality. Uh, in a very subjective way. And I would say that actually if you work in any kind of medical practice, you see this played out in the most profound ways constantly within the medical uh, environment. Yeah. The belief, the, 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 the expectations and the beliefs that people have coming into the surgeries, into the clinics, have a profound effect on uh, how they take in information and, and, and where they go with it and what they do. You also, as therapists, uh, or doctors or therapists, or mixtures of both, you also have uh, a huge advantage when it comes to uh, what I like to call all rapport. That most people who, who come in to see a doctor or a therapist are immediately in awe and have all rapport of the therapist. You could literally tell them anything, and the chance of them believing you is massive. And we'll come on to how that can actually be beneficial a little bit later. Right then. Uh, so, I want to I go through a few things with you and do, do a few demonstrations. It would have been really nice to have more people in the room, uh, but that is the way it is on a, on a cold, wet Sunday morning. Uh, that, won't, so that, that won't cause a problem though. Uh, but before, so before we get into that, I want to explain a few things based on what I said already about this idea of awareness and self-awareness. Uh, I have some real issues with the way that hypnosis is thought of and taught, uh, because I think that, that there are problems associated with it. Least of all, people often forget that the origins of hypnosis are more in, based in theatre than they are in science. 
science is, is, is being trying to catch up and understand over a long period of time. But the birth of, of hypnosis, is, in bottom line, is it's, it's born in theatre. Uh, you know, some of the earliest accounts of hypnosis that we actually have, um, uh, as we know it today, it is largely attributed, or not, not entirely attributed to James Braid, but largely attributed to Braid. Uh, and has an awful lot to do with the fact that he went and watched Anton Mesmer do his show. Mesmer being mesmerism, uh, and Anton Mesmer uh, was a showman. And this is kind of where we draw hypnosis and hypnotherapy from. And there were certain aspects of that where we've just kind of blindly accepted, you know, oh, it looks like this, it sounds like this, it must be this. Not really sure that, that that's a sensible, certainly not a scientific way forward. I don't believe in trance at all, but I absolutely believe in your belief in trance. Uh, I don't think that there is any need for um, altered states or anything of that description. What I really think is needed is your imagination, uh, which is the portal <coughs> to your belief. And um, when I say imagine, and I'm going to ask you all to imagine something in a moment. I don't just mean think about it, I mean feel and experience it too. So let me show you what I mean, let me demonstrate the distinctive difference. I'm going to imagine that my arm is held out by a balloon, a piece of string attached around my wrist up to a balloon full of helium, enough helium to actually lift my arm up to this position. Right. So I can imagine it by just going, yeah, I can, I'm kind of imagining a balloon and I'm, you know, I'm sort of visualising a balloon full of helium. I'm thinking about it. That's really not my imagination. Or at least it's such a, a pathetically weak <laughs> amount of my imagination that I'm almost embarrassing myself by my failure to involve in this imagined moment. If I really wanted to imagine that my arm was floating being held up by a balloon, what I would do is I would allow my body to create the sensations that would uh, that would cause um, me to almost hallucinate this idea, yeah? I would create the illusion through my own physiology. So the, the way I do it is I take all the weight out of my arm, because if it's being held up by a balloon, I don't need to hold my arm up, do I? So I take the weight out of my arm. I would allow my arm to feel that sense of <coughs> gentle sort of just weightlessness, as if it was just being held up. And I would feel the string, now I really do experience the sense of my arm being held up by a balloon. And it took my engagement to do that, and it took my imagination. It wasn't passive, it was very active, it was involved. Okay? So when I ask you to do something involving thinking and feeling, imagining, that is precisely what I mean. I want it to be something that you actively enjoy and feel. There's another aspect to this, which is when I'm doing this, so uh, when you do something that you can do, like walking, picking a glass up, having a drink, do you question and analyse what you're doing? No. You know, if I'm thirsty, I just <coughs> and have a drink. I have no requirement to go, now why did I want a drink? Did I really want the drink now? Was that the drink I really wanted? I don't do any of that stuff, do I? I do, not analyze. So again, if I ask you to imagine something, what I'm really asking you to do is do that. It's not difficult. Anybody who says, oh, I can't imagine things, bullshit. You've been doing that for literally every day of your life incredibly successfully. Yeah. So the idea of I can't imagine. If any of you think, oh, I can't imagine that, ask yourself the question, could I imagine myself imagining that? And the answer to that will always be yes, by the way. Could I imagine being able to imagine whatever that thing is? It's a great psychological shortcut to imagining something. Um, right, so, if you don't want to join in with this, just don't, I don't really care. It's not important to me. Uh, but it's important to you, so you might as well. What I'd like you to do is this. Where you look um, is kind of irrelevant other than the sense of distraction. So if you do want to kind of just, like, I don't know, Look at, the, look at the circle in the letter G if you wish to, or not. Do it or don't. 
All I want you to do is this. I just want you to focus on that and think. And before we do anything, there's not going to be any clever hypnotic language. You're not going to go into a trance state. Nothing like that's going to happen at all. It will be your imagination doing this. I'm simply going to move, look to move something into your sub-awareness, into your sense of happening to you rather than doing it. And it will last for a moment or two. So uh, have a look at that. We are blatantly also making use of a natural amount of eye fatigue. I won't lie to you about what I'm doing. I'm going to be entirely honest in all of my dishonesty. So I want you to focus on that circle in the liturgy, or anywhere else if you like. And I just want you to think about a sense of your eyes and how, much, and how heavy your eyes naturally feel. Your eyelids kind of have a sense of weight to them. Most of the time you don't think about this. Would you? But now and again you become more aware. Say for example at the end of a day when you feel tired and then suddenly you feel this sense of or we, we articulate it with, you know, my eyes feel heavy. So I want you to imagine your eyelids starting to feel heavy. And when I say imagine it, I mean really think about it, really feel it, allow it to happen. And continue imagining them getting heavier and heavier until, obviously and very naturally, you would imagine them getting so heavy that they would actually need to close. And once that happens, allow them to close. So keep imagining that until your eyes close. Now anybody who doesn't close their eyes by this point is either not listening to what I'm saying or actively trying to prove something to themselves which is laughable if you think about it. Or you're not wanting to join it, which is fine too. Any of you who now have your eyes closed, I want you to continue to imagine your eyes feeling heavier still and getting heavier and heavier. I want you to imagine what it would feel like when they are heavy enough so that you wouldn't be able to lift them. And imagine you get to that point. Imagine your eyes are so heavy that you can't lift them. And once you know that you can't lift them, try and find that you can't. Test your own imagination and try and open your eyes. And the more you try, the more you'll feel them sticking and gluing and locking tighter and tighter. Really try. Genuinely put all of your effort in. Don't pretend. Really try as hard as you possibly can to open your eyes. In fact, to the point where almost it feels uncomfortable, even slightly panicky, really genuinely try and open your eyes. Don't pretend. Really put all your effort in. And no matter how hard you try, you simply cannot do it. Now simply stop imagining that you can't open your eyes and allow them to open. Stop imagining that you can't open them. Or better still, imagine that you can. Imagine that you can open your eyes now. And open your eyes. Right. So, uh, be honest, be honest, a show of hands who genuinely had an experience, however fleeting, of, holy crap, I can't open my eyes. Put your hands up if you had a genuine experience of, I can't open my eyes. I, I kind of think you must be in that category too, because it took you such a long time to open your eyes again. No, I think I was thinking about it too much. Well, the irony being is that you still didn't open them. Okay. <laughs> Right, so, uh, nothing weird, nothing, nothing miraculously hypnotic. The real magic, if you like, was the moment that your brain said, said, articulated, however it did that, whether verbally or just with a sense and a feeling, all of you who couldn't open your eyes had a moment where you internally thought, ha, I can't open my eyes. That's the moment that your belief happened. That's the key and the critical moment right there. Uh, so can you put your hands back up who had that kind of fairly profound experience? Uh, could I borrow a couple of people? Uh, can I, would you mind, sir? Yeah. And this lady here, would you be okay if yeah. you're comfortable? If you're not comfortable, yeah, feel comfortable and do it anyway. Uh, up you come. People will spontaneously clap. It's how it works. <laughs> Charlotte, sorry? Charlotte. Charlotte and Earl. Earl. Uh, Earl, if I can get you to come and stand over here. And Charlotte, if I can get you to stand here. So what I'm going to do is a few more <coughs> kind of fun things with you, uh, work on the same level. Now what I'm going to also do is I'm going to break some, some perceived protocol of hypnosis. One of the things if you learn hypnosis is that there is a sense that you, you have to maintain this kind of bubble uh, of belief, this, this, this world that you put them in. That they go into this trance state and you have to maintain this trance state. Uh, I'm going to not do that, I'm going to break the fourth wall. I'm going to be constantly explaining not only what I'm doing, but why I'm doing it, why it's working, how it's working, uh, yet it's, it will still work. Does that make sense? Yeah. Fantastic. Uh, uh, we're going to start off with something that is blatantly to trick your brain. Uh, 
Why not? Uh, put your feet shoulder width apart <coughs> and place one foot forward so it's sort of heel and toe in line with the other. Slightly wider apart. Cool. Uh, and look down at your at your your toe. Just look down at your toe. Perfect stuff. Uh, just before we continue, I also want to make something very clear. I'll, I'll keep moving so it really annoys the cameraman. <laughs> uh, I want to make something very clear, and that is uh, the reason I pick these people is not because, oh, some people can be hypnotized, some people can't be hypnotized. That's a lie. Sorry, hypnosis folks, that's a lie. Everybody experiences this stuff all the time, every day, because it's not a thing, it's not a profound altered state of reality, it's just what we do as human beings. There are things that we do that we know we do. There are things that we do we experience as happening to us. And that's all we're talking about here. The rest of it is just about a theatrical show more than anything else. The reason that hypnotists came up with this only one in five people are somnambulists and, only, you know, and two in five people can't be hypnotized, that sounds to me like a get out clause because I couldn't do it, doesn't it? Yeah? It's a get out clause. Yeah? You don't respond to it. So I go, well, not everybody can be hypnotized. What? That's not a scientific answer to that problem at all. That's just, that's an opt-out. The, re the reality is, if somebody, if somebody doesn't experience hypnosis, it's probably either because they, the expectations were wrong in the first place, my, my, my explanation was wrong, or they didn't understand what I was asking them to do. It might simply be that they weren't engaging in the process at all themselves. Or most of all, it's probably because they have some belief system in them already that is prohibiting them from engaging in what's going on. Yeah? I'm not letting somebody control me. But if you just don't, if you just refuse, then nothing's going to happen, is it? Because contrary to what some people think, hypnosis is not a sequence of spells and rituals. But if you believe hypnosis is about if I shake your hand in this way and pull it at this time and say these magic words, you're absolutely suggesting that hypnosis is spells and rituals. And fine a few hundred years ago if you want to believe that, not so fine if you're still believing that's what it is today. Yeah? Right. I'd like to just step off my soapbox box quickly. Um, what I'd like you to do is this. Have a look at your toes. Uh, have a look at your toes at the front. Take a nice deep breath. And as you breathe out, I want you to imagine, really think and feel, your foot starting to get heavier. Just really feel that. Start feeling that getting heavier. In the same way that you felt your eyes getting heavier, feel your foot getting heavier. It's heavier and heavier until it gets so heavy that you can't lift it. Try and lift it. Try. The more you try, the more it sticks and glues a lot. Keep trying and lifting it. And the more you try. Now, I don't know about you, but I think you can spread from the heel all the way through to the toe. So the entire foot was completely locked and stuff. Try and lift it. Genuinely try. Try as hard as you can. Really try. And the more you try, the more it sticks and glues and locks. No weird, fun, hypnotic language. I'll prance around like an idiot if it helps dispel some of these rumors and myths. Now, some of you might be thinking, this is blatantly a postural trick. Which it could be. But that won't account for the fact that the other feet are also stuck to the floor. Both feet on, on both legs, both feet on both legs, each foot on either side is both stuck to the floor. Try and lift either foot and find you can't. Like rock backwards and forwards, you know, change your centre of gravity and prove that you cannot lift either of your feet. And the more you try, the more they stick in glue. Now I think that one here, this one here could stick twice as much now. See? Now that's twice as stuck as that one is, and this one over here is twice as stuck as the other. Now none of that makes any sense, and you could think that's clever hypnotic language. No, not really. It's just something I made up. Now in the same way that your feet are stuck, and while you could still believe that maybe there's something postural or gravitational about that, it won't account for the fact that in the same way that your feet are stuck to the floor, your hand sticks to your head. Precisely the same way that feeling moves up your body and sticks your hand to your head. And the same with you, you could just allow your hands to stick and glue and lock tighter and tighter. Genuinely try and unstick your hand and find that you can't. Now I can unstick it easily, look. But if I put it back, it will stick ten times as tightly. That one's just totally stuck. I can, even I can't do anything about that. Try and move either of your hands and find that you can't. Really try. Now, very importantly, very importantly, you can still look at the audience, you can still talk in every... Do, yeah. yeah. You're not... Uh, do either of you in any way, shape or form feel uh, asleep? In a state of trance? No. So you both feel completely normal in every single way, except you can't lift either of your feet or unglue your hands from your head. Is that accurate? 
Yeah. Yeah. Scary. It's weird, isn't it? Yeah. But all that's really going on is I have invited you as human beings to play a game. At every level, I've asked you to do something, to experience it as if it is happening to you. I've engaged your childlike mind, if you like, to really engage in a bit of fun play. And your brain has gone, sure, why not? That'd be a great fun. And the only thing that I've done is I've, I've to, to create this process, and I haven't done it because I actually know that you already do it so well yourselves, I've simply asked you to withhold some information. So right now, the reason that your hand is stuck to your head is because what's really going on is your body is pushing your hand against your head. The reason it feels like it's stuck is that that information has stopped coming up for your, to your awareness. That's all. That's the only thing that's happened. The reason that your feet are stuck to the ground is because you're actually pushing down on your feet, which is why they feel stuck. And they really do feel stuck, don't they? Yeah. Because you're still pushing down. And even me telling you that's what you're doing makes no difference to the fact that it's happening. Which, by the way, if you do the research and you're looking to Kirsch and Lin's work on placebo, this is pretty much what we're talking about. Placebo works even when I tell you it's a placebo. There is no difference between the lie or the truth when it comes to the placebo. In the same way that I can tell both of you exactly what you're doing, exactly why it's working and how, yet it makes no difference to the placebo effect working. Okay? Part of what I want you to get from this is, we really don't need the spells and the rituals. We don't. Yes? And actually we put a lot of people off when we keep using spells and rituals. We like to believe, oh well people like spells and rituals, it helps, it helps make it work better. No it doesn't. It makes no difference. Now you can use them if you want to, but it doesn't make, it's not, there's no point. Like for example, sorry, Charlotte? Yeah. Charlotte, right. Uh, I'm going to ask you to close your eyes for a second for no other reason than it's just going to stop you being visually distracted. Close your eyes. Okay, inside your mind right now is your name. <clears throat> it doesn't matter whether you've ever thought about it like that before, but just become aware, use your imagination to become aware of your, your, your name inside your head, somewhere inside your mind. Yeah, just nod your head that you have that. Imagine your name, uh, and I don't, I don't know whether it's just a sound or you visualise it or whether it's a feeling or a colour, I really don't care. But whatever your name is to you, I want you to imagine it goes from where it is in your mind and it moves into your hand so it's no longer in your head. Does that make sense? So your name moves from your, from your mind into your hand, um, uh, so there's nothing left behind. Where your name used to be, there's nothing there. So it's just in your hand and there's nothing left behind. Nod your head when it's just in your hand. Good. So if we were to, you can open your eyes, and you can look at your hand and you can see your name clearly, and it's no longer in your mind, it's just in your hand. There's nothing where your name used to be, is there? Now, if we would take your name and put it out of sight and out of mind, mm -hmm. so it was completely gone, so there was nothing where it used to be, try and say your name and find you can't. And the more you try and think about it, just find there's nothing there. Generally, try and find your name. Just find there's nothing there at all. Better still, with the other hand, imagine loads of different names above you, like every other name, in, literally every name in the world above you. Yeah? Reach up and take any one of those names at random. Just reach up and grab any name at random. You can pop it in your head. What's your name? Sarah. Nice to meet you, Sarah. <laughs> and that feels right, normal, and proper, doesn't it? That's who you are. Now, Sarah isn't just a name, it's an identity. Sarah has a full character. So what does Sarah do for a living? What do you do for a living? I mean, you can just know that. What, does, what do you do for a living? Doctor. You're a doctor. Excellent stuff. And your name is? Charlotte. Okay. So now we have a disconnect because you stopped imagining it. That's all. Yeah? But suggestion is easy enough to do. So we can take that name and we can just pull it away and throw it into the distance until it's completely gone. And there is no <coughs> nothing left behind. Try and say your name now and find it's gone. Try it. Charlotte. So now you're holding on to it. Yeah? You can take your hand away from behind your back. Now, does that mean that everything else is also collapsed as well, or are your feet still stuck to the floor? Yeah, and why? Because all of it was just your imagination. And all that happened was she stopped imagining. Yes? Give Charlotte a yeah. <laughs>
which by the way is also, you can take your hand down because that will get uncomfortable, um, uh, but your feet are still stuck. <laughs> um, test it, test it, check, check, still stuck. Ah, annoying. So here's the thing. This also is a great reason why in hypnosis there is absolutely no necessity to wake somebody up, to go through this weird protocol. Yeah? I'm going to count from one to five, and when I count to five, your eyes can open, you'll be back in the room. One, every nerve muscle, and five are coming back to life. Two, taking deep breaths, filling your lungs with oxygen. Three, feeling like fresh waves of water running from the top of your head to the tip of your toe. Da 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 da. Five, eyes open, wide awake. Um, we weren't sleeping. We weren't sleeping. The only thing that you ever need to do to undo any, any sense of suggestion is simply to say, you know you're imagining this, don't you? Uh, yeah, actually, now I do. I do know. I'm, I'm now aware of that. Okay, stop. Stop imagining it. If you ever come across an abnormal reaction, an ab reaction in hypnosis, where somebody starts to freak out, don't panic because that's a crappy suggestion. Yeah. Use suggestion. Literally make something up and just have the the total intent that it will work. Yeah. No. Oh, you're freaking out, aren't you? Yes, I am. All right, give me your hand. I'm going to shake it three times, and you, you, like, each time you're just going to feel yourself building up with energy, and the third time I shake it, you'll just feel amazing. One, two, three. You feel amazing, don't you? Yeah! Belief, imagination. But you can take it further. Can you hold your hand out like this one? Bring it back to there. So, um, think about something solid like wood or metal. What are you thinking about? Wood. wood. Think, think about the way that wood would feel. It sounds weirdly hypnotic, but it wasn't meant to be. The, the stiffness, the rigidity, the solidity of wood, yeah? Now as you're thinking about that, start to notice the way that your fingers start to stiffen up as if they become like wood. You can imagine and feel them getting stiffer and stiffer as if they're becoming like wood. Can you feel that? There, yeah, there we go, I can feel that too. So your entire hand starts to become completely and utterly wood-like. There we go. Now it's not up here yet, is it? Oh no, it, oh yeah, it is now, yeah, 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 it is now. But it's, it's not up here though. Tell me when it arrives up to the top of your arm. There we go. Yeah. So now your entire arm is like wood, completely solidly locked like wood. And the thing about wood, of course, is the wood itself, there's no sense, there's no feeling. It's dead, isn't it? Wood is essentially a dead substance. Uh, outside, you know, the very core of it has the life running through it, but once you get to the outside, the extremity of the wood, it's completely utterly dead. It's lifeless. It has no feeling, no sense at all. And I don't know if you can already notice how that your hand has completely changed and starts to feel oddly numb and desensitized. Now, can I borrow your other hand a second? Now, feel, feel the difference. Real sense. But here, tell, tell me when, tell me when the, the sense, the feeling goes all together. So it really becomes as if it's not even your hand anymore, as if it's just like somebody else's, like a dead piece of wood, like a mannequin's hand. Is it, is it there yet? Use your other hand to give yourself a good, a good pinch of squeeze. Can I just undo your cuff link? Uh, not your cuff link, undo your thing, and just pull your sleeve up slightly. Do you mind? Yeah. And can you feel, can you feel how, uh, you know, really right up here, give it a really good pinch, a good pinch and a twist, and there's no, you, you, really, you, you know you're doing it, but there's no feeling, there's no awareness at all, is there? No. Could you have a sit down over here for me? Have a little sit down, just there. And just rest your hand down on there. And actually, you can just, you can really just feel that that's no longer yours at all, because it really isn't yours. You're not, gonna, you're not gonna need it for a few moments. And you can keep, just keep playing with it, pitching it, just keep reminding yourself of how much it is not yours. Um, that really, that's completely dead now, yes? Now would you just, hypothetically, would you be, would you be willing to, to test that, to, to prove to yourself how dead it is by maybe having a, a needle pushed through it? Because it's not yours. I mean, you could, you could push a needle through that effortlessly, couldn't you, because there's no, there's no sense, there's no feeling, there's no discomfort. You'd be, you know, as long as somebody who was medically trained and was doing the job, you'd be happy for that to happen, yes? Well, just, I mean, any, 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 any pain, any discomfort, yeah. it's completely dead, isn't it? It's lifeless. Yeah. I mean, do we have a doctor in the house? Somebody, somebody who would be medically trained and able to do this? Oh, um, yeah, I am a doctor. Yeah, yeah. would you be happy? Yeah. I'll talk you through it. I'll talk you both through it. You're happy for this. Hi, yes. for this. It's the same way, I'm now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so. Yeah. I mean, you're not hypnotised, you're not asleep at all. No. Now, the bottom line is, he's purely, he's fully capable of making 
informed consent. Okay. Do you feel comfortable to do this? Because right now you know that you're not feeling any uh, discomfort or pain in your arm. Yeah, test it again. I mean, you know, really, really put yourself to the test. Give it a good squeeze. And if you're absolutely happy, that it's as if you've been given a, a like a proper uh, block, a proper full limb block, yeah, where you could not possibly feel any pain. And that's how you feel right now, isn't it? So there's no reason why this couldn't be done. So if you would just, you know, the equipment's there. I believe I asked for everything. Is that everything there? Is there anything that's missing? These these are the guys that that are responsible. Yeah. And just basically, all you need to do is, you know, bridge it up and just slide it through there. We've got a little steroid if you just. Uh, Can you pass it on? You won't need just it. Tissue, just tissue. Just tissue, but you won't need it. Okay. You really won't need it. Because actually what you'll find is that one of the things about this is the blood is just going to move away from the surface of the skin and there will be virtually no bleeding at all. Mm -hmm. You'll find that the whole process will be ridiculously like, it will be as if you're pushing it through a mannequin. Yeah? You know, go back to your medical training and you were stabbing needles into oranges and stuff like that. That's pretty much what's going to happen. You can watch it because it's not even your arm. Yeah? And just recognise and breathe through it and know that it's not your hand, it's completely, yeah, and just slide it in and make sure, yeah, because yeah. that's not yours. Yeah. Any discomfort? Any, anything, you know, did you, did you even notice the needle going into your arm? No. It's, you know, just the way it works. Now what's really interesting about this is, and we can just leave it there for a moment, won't be for long, uh, Somebody very quickly, if I may. Uh, has anybody here been like formally hypnotised before? Formally hypnotised. Yeah. The way you open. Uh, so, the chat there. What's your name? Fernando. Fernando, can I borrow you really, really quickly? Uh, I won't do this with you because you're busy. I would have done it with you otherwise. Are you you're comfortable? You're bored, aren't you? Now it's just like it's not even yours. Can I get you to stand here? Now, earlier on, you had that experience. Uh, just stand there. Earlier on, you had that experience where you closed your eyes and you couldn't open and then it felt like they were really heavy, lots of tight. And just feel that now. Feel your eyes getting heavier and heavier until they're completely lot stick and glue, tighter and tighter and tighter. That's it. Really feel that. And notice the way your eyes gently flicker. Now, I want you to imagine what a really deep and profound depth of hypnosis would be like for you. Maybe you've seen it in the films and the movies. But the whole idea that when the hypnotist says the word sleep, what happens is the mind, the body just sort of collapses, you know, your body relaxes and everything just goes completely quiet and you become really hyper-suggestible, yeah, and you can feel that happening and you can feel that real sense just slowly beginning to get closer and closer and closer to you and then you can just take a deep breath in and relax and sleep and just relax and go all the way down, all the way deep, all the way completely and utterly sleep, relax deeper and deeper. All the way down, that's it. Every nerve, muscle, and fiber. And in fact, I'd like you to imagine the deepest level of hypnosis that you could possibly imagine. And as you take a deep breath in and breathe out, you can go all the way down, even deeper than you can imagine, to the most profound depth. There we go. And I can, I can continue to talking to people, and you can continue to drift deeper and deeper. Deeper and deeper into what, I hear you ask. Didn't you say that this was all nothing to do with that? Yes, you're absolutely right. All I'm doing is I'm <coughs> painting a nice picture for his imagination to take hold of. That's literally all I'm doing. The only benefit of words is to help his imagination. That's it. That's all that's going on, going deeper and deeper. Right. So, when I say, uh, when I'm asking you to open your eyes, you'll notice that with your eyes open, you can stay in this profound, lovely state and even go deeper with your eyes open. So you can just test that and allow your eyes to open and just feel yourself drifting even deeper, even deeper still. And I'm just gonna get you to turn your head so you can see the arm over there. Can you see that arm over there? Yes? Okay, so this, this, there we go, that's fine. I'm just gonna move a few things so you can see clearer. There we go. Okay, so you can see the arm over there, and your mind is going to just make a lovely connection as you just close your eyes and go deeper, all the way down, deeper, deeper, deeper. That arm is this arm here. 
So when you see that arm, you feel and see this arm here, not your head that you understand, that that arm becomes this arm with all the sensations alive and alive and well. The deeper and deeper you go, feeling, sensing, becoming aware of everything and every feeling. That's it, not your head that you understand. That that arm is this arm here. On all the pain, and all the discomfort that you know that arm should feel with a needle pushed through it, you can start to feel in exactly the same position right here. Open your eyes and start to feel that sensation. So how does your arm feel right now? Can you feel that discomfort? Do you feel it stinging? It feels weird. It feels weird, yeah. Now, um, <coughs> You can see your arm here, yes? Yeah? But if I were to just if I were to just slide the needle a bit further in, you can feel that really hurting, really stinging. Can you feel that? Yeah? Now if we ask you to take slowly take that out, you can get rid of it as far as you can feel it being pulled out, yes? Something from right now. Yeah. And it's, it's really painful. Yeah. Now of course if you turn your head to the front, you can still feel that arm. And if I were to really hit that arm hard, can you feel that? Okay. Is that painful? Uncomfortable. Uncomfortable, yes. Yeah. <coughs> I'm just gonna I'm, I'm just gonna get a light on okay. If I just start to heat the arm up, tell me when you can feel it getting hotter. I feel it now getting hotter. Yeah. Tell me when it starts to really burn. Now it's getting too hot. Okay, good stuff. And sleep. Knowing that you're not actually asleep in any way, shape or form, but the word kind of felt like a good trigger. I tell you what, we'll change the word and we'll use potato instead. When I say the word potato, your eyes are open. And when I say the word potato again, your eyes close. Potato. Potato. Yeah, just proving what an absolute load of crap that whole thing is. Yeah. <coughs> Okay, bottom line is, thank you very much indeed for being a great sport. You can stop imagining all of the stuff you were imagining. You can stand up, people will clap as you go back to your seat. Uh, if you feel any, do you feel in any way kind of weird and groggy? Because people are a bit groggy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which because I've asked you to sit there and pretend you were sleeping for the last 10 minutes. Give me a hand. And because we're going to use imagination for this, I'm going to shake your hand just twice because that's all you will need. First time you'll feel this flow of energy. Second time you'll just feel really alive and ready for the day. You ready for this? Here we go, first time. Felt that? Yeah, second time. Wow, then, good stuff. Off you go. Okay, so what's interesting here is no bleeding, no excess of any description. Yeah, it still feels completely unlike your arm. Yeah, all I would like you to do is take this hand and place it on your shoulder up here. And as you just slowly run your hand all the way down to the end of your fingertips, I just want you to really imagine all the life flowing back into your hand, knowing that all the all the feelings uh, that, that you have of, of relief, that you know, that basically no pain, no discomfort, full range of movement, everything back to normal, uh, and your hand will feel as if nothing has happened to it at all. And that's just what I want you to have in your mind as you run your hand down and go for it. Uh, people will then spontaneously clap, and you can go back to your seat. Okay, really quickly because time is running out. So, uh, every aspect of our life, our thinking, our beliefs is the product of suggestion and then the cognitive bias loops uh, that these suggestions uh, create. We edit out what doesn't conform uh, to our own thinking, especially uh, when it challenges our sense of identity and our investment uh, and our heritage. Uh, you know, you think about how invested we become in what we believe. You know, you go on a training course for a certain thing that you learn, and you invest 2,000, 5,000, 10,000 pounds in a training schedule. It's very hard after you've invested that much money and that much time for somebody to turn around and go, well, it kind of works, but 50% of it is bullshit. You're not, gonna, you're not gonna pay attention to that because you've invested too much and you've told too many people how great this thing that you know is and how much you believe in it. And we stop ourselves from growing as a result. Belief is important. Uh, hypnosis has been shrouded in an appalling amounts of mystery and misbelief.
four centuries because it was born out of theatre, and nothing really has changed. There is a, a huge uh, work within the scientific community to understand hypnosis better. I would highly suggest you look into the work um, uh, of the researcher Adam Eason uh, for more information on this and the work that he's currently doing to, to properly uh, evidence and research and resource uh, hypnosis. Um, be very careful about anything that falls into the category of spells and rituals. If anybody is telling you that, uh, you know, I have this, this induction, this special induction, and I can teach you this set of moves, yeah, this ritual that puts somebody into hypnosis, it's really not a good idea. I've just had the zero time left thing. I started late, you can wait. <laughs> uh, what I really want to say very quickly to finish this off is, there is, because of all the, all the misinformation about the world of hypnosis, uh, because of all the different theories, uh, there is a massive divide between all of this world, not just of hypnosis, but all of the therapeutic world. There is a huge divide between that and the scientific community. Doctors still to this day have a habit, and understandably so, of turning their nose up at anything that is slightly left field when it comes to this kind of stuff. So, uh, very, very quickly, sorry about this, I, um, uh, just very quickly I want you to consider, say, uh, something like homeopathy for a moment. From a scientific point of view, there is, and apologies for homeopathies here, but, you know, you've really got to suck this up, I'm afraid. There is no evidence to support the efficacy of homeopathy based on the beliefs in, in what they're saying, you know, how it does what it does. There really just, I'm sorry, there just isn't the damn evidence. Yeah. Uh, one of my favourite demonstrations by a friend of mine, uh, James Randi, is he gets uh, bottles of uh, homeopathic sleeping pills, and on the bo bottle they say, do not overdose, danger of overdose, do not take more than whatever, whatever. And he downs a bottle of these at night, uh, when he does his show. He just downs a bottle of these. Why? They don't do anything. Because he doesn't believe that they will do anything. They don't do anything. Because it's working because of belief and expectation and all things hypnotic and placebo and suggestibility. And suggestibility doesn't mean that you're weak at all in, in any way, shape or form. We have, a, we have the wrong ideas of the words belief and the word, word suggestibility. What we can't do though is we can't deny that there is an absolute benefit for people who use homeopathy. I'm not saying that homeopathy is crap at all. It has a place, it has a benefit. What I'm saying is we, 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 need to be, we need to be understanding the difference between what really is going on in comparison to what people are telling us are going on because of what they want to believe or what they've invested in or what they just wish for thinking, magical thinking. Uh, I would argue that the real reason why homeopathy works, EFT, TFT, Havening, all of these things are the, the, the big thing that underpins them all and why they, they have better medical effects sometimes than medical stuff is this. It's about belief. Belief is made up of connection and in connection I mean uh, expectation. Time well spent. Yeah? You go to see a, a therapy, a practitioner and they meet you, a human being, and they give you time. They care about you and that has a huge and profound effect on your expectation and their intent. You go to a doctor or a hospital and uh, you're either just being rushed in and rushed out because of too many time constraints uh, or you're just a number on a chart. Yeah? And, and we can't dismiss how important that is in the therapeutic process. Suggestion itself. Suggestion is everything. Suggestion is not magical language. Suggestion is simply using, uh, using my, my, my body language, my words, my tonality, my gestures to paint a picture, to create a reality for you. And finally, your imagination. Your ability to take the connection that I give you, the words that I use, the pictures I paint, and make them real in the way that you think. Instead of seeing people's beliefs and what we can do as an anti-science, we should see belief as a therapeutic boost to the science and the medicine that we already have. We should take what has existed for centuries, what we call the witch doctor effect. And rather than just going, oh, it's all this airy-fairy rubbish and there's nothing scientific about it at all, what we should do is we should take our science and we should add their belief and combine the two 
to help healing, to speed up the process. Just a very quick example, uh, uh, paracetamol, approximately 11 minutes for efficacy. You take a paracetamol uh, orally, it's about 11 minutes on average for it to have any effect on your body, on your systems, yes? Now if you as a practitioner gave somebody paracetamol and said, I don't know whether you'll feel the effects immediately or in the next five minutes, but you let me know when you feel it. And you will find an astonishing number of people will say, within the first five minutes, oh yes, I can feel it working now. And then do the same thing with the placebo. Here's a placebo. I don't know whether you'll feel the effects immediately or in the next five minutes, but you let me know when you do. And do you know what? The same thing will happen. Right, there we go. I will quickly wrap this up. Uh, if you are interested, uh, in anything that I've talked about, if you would like to know more about reality bending, listen, I'm not a doctor, I can't tell you exactly what, how to use this in your practice, uh, but what I can do is I can really teach you what's really going on, how to make it work, how to use it, how to not be tied down to the rules and the regulations of hypnosis, etc., and how to really manipulate belief and understanding in other people. It's what I've spent the last 20 years of doing. And genuinely, I can make you hallucinate things. If we'd had five more minutes and I didn't have to move on, the next thing I would have done with, with, with you uh, after that demonstration, I'd have got you to hallucinate something utterly mental in the room. And it would have worked. And you would have absolutely believed, holy crap, I can see that thing that isn't there. N not because I've got magical special powers, simply because I just know how to do this and I've spent years practicing. So if you want to know how it works, uh, uh, basically QR code, if you've got a phone, take a quick snap of it, uh, or write down the URL, or just contact me via email. Um, if you do go to the URL, if you do want to know a little bit more about reality bending, uh, sign up to that, give us your name and your email, we'll send you another email back, and basically you can give me some feedback on what you thought of this presentation. Thank you all very much indeed. Sorry I overran ever so slightly. Thank you.